Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you will notice that I came here with a bottle of hot water because hot water is a binary. Uh, either it's in you or you're in it. And I thought that rather than uh, suffering one or the other, I might as well take a sip or two. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the opening session of the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue 2023. This is where we take our departure fix as we set off of our, on our journey of exploration of the nuances and uh, the facets of maritime connectivity. We have focused uh, this session on a representative sampling of, of a number of major uh, maritime connectivity routes and the many questions uh, and issues that attend them. However, this opening session uh, also affords all of us at the NMF the opportunity to gratefully um, thank and acknowledge the generosity of our handful of benefactors without whose beneficence this foundation would be impoverished both literally uh, and figuratively. Uh, of course, right in the front of all that lies the Indian Navy, but I speak not of large multinational uh, behemoths, but of individual naval officers who have been giants uh, that strode the maritime space with enviable confidence uh, and competence, giants whose giant hearts enabled them to reach into their individual savings accounts, please mark my words, individual savings accounts, to create fellowships and establish grants to sustain the intellectual and analytical activities of the NMF. Not, e not all of them were of equal rank, uh, and yet all of them, without exception, were certainly of equal stature. And so they are the people whose thoughts and visions uh, particularly guide us even today. They uh, afford us beacons of hope uh, that there is in this large mass of the Indo-Pacific in general and India in particular, a group of individuals who still exist, whose hearts beat for the maritime connectivities and the maritimity that India must embrace because these are centuries of the seas the next 200 years. And in those 200 years, India will either be a maritime power or we will not be any kind of power at all. So, as I said, these are giants upon whose shoulders we at the NMF have stood as we have striven to gain national and international uh, recognition and traction. These are giants whose thoughts will continue to guide us. So who are these people, you might well ask? Well, I speak today of the late Admiral Adhar Kumar Chatterjee, whose birth this in the year 1914, we will celebrate a week from today. And like some great supernova, uh, he, whose brilliance uh, lit up India's maritime firmament and continues to illuminate it, uh, it remains undiminished, that particular brilliance, to this very day. Uh, he was an exceptional visionary, a planner, a naval practitioner, and not only did he rise uh, meteor-like to the high office of the chief of the naval staff, an office that he graced from March uh, 1966 to February of 1970, but he was the very first Indian naval officer very first Indian naval officer to don the rank, the insignia, and the regalia of a full admiral. His daughters, who are with us in the audience today, have been instrumental in creating the Admiral A.K. Chatterjee Fellowship at the National Maritime Foundation. I also speak uh, of another colossus of India's maritime thinking, the late Vice Admiral Keval Kishan Nair, who was the NMF's founding chairman and whose worthy son and daughter have honored their father's uh, passion for maritimity by establishing the Vice Admiral K.K. Nair Fellowship. I am honored to be able to narrate yet another name, and that is that of the late Commodore Surendra Kumar Kale, former commanding officer of the Indian Navy's pride and joy of its time, the battlecruiser Mysore. His wife, Mrs. Savita Kale, is today 92 odd years of age. And yet, she has emptied, and I mark my words once, I request you to mark my words once again, emptied her entire family pension account and donated its entire proceeds to the National Maritime Foundation to establish the Commodore Surendra Kale and Mrs. Savita Kale grant at the NMF for young scholars to establish the kind of scholarship that, as I mentioned, India, India needs and cannot do without. This is a true naval wife, this, 
is a true naval wife, ladies and gentlemen, one to admire, one to appreciate, one to emulate. I request you to join me in expressing my gratitude and our own gratitude to all three of these individuals who individually and collectively embody the spirit of maritime endeavor that this series of the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue seeks to advance into perpetuity. Please join me. <clears throat> and with that, let me turn to this opening session in the course of which we expect to be guided by the presence and perspectives of not only eminent maritime thinkers from near and far, but also by a special address by one of independent India's foremost political voices, that of Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman, former defense minister, the incumbent honorable finance minister of the Union of India, and a longtime supporter of both the National Maritime Foundation and, of course, the Indian Navy, and most important of all, the IPRD process. Since uh, everyone is here, is aware and knows well that a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, let me offer you a pictorial uh, uh, overview of the session that, it, uh, that is at hand. In the heart of the world's most dynamic and diverse region, a complex web of maritime connectivity is transforming the way nations trade, cooperate, and prosper. Welcome to the Indo-Pacific, a vast expanse where nations are interconnected through maritime routes, fostering economic growth, innovation, and shared prosperity. The Indo-Pacific is home to some of the world's busiest ports, acting as pivotal nodes in the global supply chain. From the thriving port of Singapore, the bustling metropolis of Mumbai, the strategic location of Colombo, to the dynamic hub of Shanghai, these ports serve as gateways to the world, facilitating trade and cooperation. Cargo ships, <coughs> carrying everything from electronics to automobiles, transport goods seamlessly across vast distances, thanks to the region's maritime connectivity. This connectivity is driving economic growth in the Indo-Pacific, with trade volumes reaching record highs year after year. The impact of maritime connectivity is not limited to geoeconomic goals. It also extends to the non-geoeconomic goals, such as prestige, respect, comity, cultural influence, and people-to-people -people engagement. The Indo-Pacific's maritime connectivity is fostering a sense of cooperation and diplomacy that transcends borders. This session will explore the possibilities of enhancing the nodes of maritime connectivity by delving into issues such as cost-benefit trade analysis of the Northern Sea Route for Japan and China, contemporary effectiveness of the Belt and Road Initiative and Global Development Initiative with specific regard to the West Asian and East African littoral, comparative analysis of the ports of Banda Abbas, Chabaha and Gawada vis-à-vis -vis the International North-South Transport Corridor, maritime connectivity in Oceania as a sub-region of the Indo-Pacific and collaborative options to enhance connectivity therein. As we look to the future, the Indo-Pacific's nodes of maritime connectivity will continue to play a pivotal role in shaping the world's economic and strategic landscape. Now, it is time to explore this remarkable region and its nodes of maritime connectivity that are charting the course for a brighter future. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there is a great deal of hype and hoopla in the media and in among, also amongst uh, scholars of international relations and geopolitics uh, about the increasing number of mega connectivity projects and the ports that constitute their nodes. For example, much is being made of the shortened distance uh, between northern European and East Asian ports. A question that we need to debate here as to whether we ought to be realistically taking distance as the sole criterion uh, in determining the success of a maritime trade route. In any case, the NSR is shorter than the southern sea route or the SSR only for ports that are located north of Shanghai. But ports that are located north of Shanghai have hydrology, which is shallow and prone to large amounts of siltation. So the business models that attach themselves 
to successful development of ports north of Shanghai are very different from the business models that attract themselves or attach themselves to ports that are south of the port of Shanghai or the mouth of the Yangtze River. Here, south of the Yangtze River, the ports are deep, rocky, and capable of handling large vessels without the need for continuous dredging. And therefore, oh, so are these comments of mine uh, validated by facts on the ground? Our panelists, I hope, will tell us the answer to that. Likewise, while distance per se might well be shorter, the volume of goods that can be uh, carried on a single voyage on a sing given ship uh, is a function of the ship's size and the ship's design, and particularly the ship's draft, both of which are heavily influenced by the average as well as the minimum depth available. So if you take the northern sea route once again, uh, and you decide that you want to take the water and the uh, water which is available in the Dmitry Laptev and the Samnikov Straits south of the new Siberian islands, it is pretty shallow. It's only 6.7 meters. And depths of 6.7 meters cannot support large volumes of trade. So since only low volumes of cargo can be transported by a given ship, economies of scale cannot be attained. Moreover, a maritime trade route is far more than simply a dyad of the destination port versus the loading port. To make the route economically viable or profitable, shippers need to move cargo from and to multiple seaports along any given route, and those seaports must have hinterland connectivity from which cargo will move both hinterland, into the hinterland and from the hinterland. It is only that which makes for a shipping lane. These ports now need to be well connected, therefore, through multimodal transportation corridors. Without these intermediate ports and or hinterland connectivity that they provide, a shipping route will simply not be profitable. And so what is the situation on the Northern Sea Route? And it is once again to this panel that we turn for answers to this question. And finally, there's the uh, question of the percentage of China's merchandise trade, both imports and exports, that is accounted for by Northern Europe. This is less than 3%. And it's unlikely to rise much higher, particularly given the EU's, the European Union's hardening stand, including that of Germany, which is the only northern European country other than Russia that could possibly benefit from the shorter NSR vis-a-vis -vis merchandise trade with China. Only time will tell if this is going to continue to be true in a post-Xi Jinping era. These basic considerations are not, I repeat, they are not area-specific but they are valid across varying geographies. Where multimodal transportation of shipping cargo is concerned, factors of distance and time must be weighed against the volume that can be transported as a function of economies of scale. Wherever, whenever cargo is shifted from one mode of, of uh, transportation to another mode, there are inevitable significant delays that accrue as a result of non-standardization. Take railway gauges. If your gauges are not standardized across, you will have a significant problem immediately. And of soft infrastructure, uh, particularly related to issues as, as good as, as simple as signing a customs declaration form. Where does your form go? Does it go from top to bottom? Do you read from left to right, right to left? Where should you sign? Having this done electronically doesn't change the problem. And so there are significant problems that we need to address and we will be addressing. So where these factors all come and play out is as much in the Northern Sea Route as it is in the IMEC. It is as much in the IMEC as it is in the INSTC. Mega corridors also have mega challenges. Mega challenges require and produce mega opportunities. Mega opportunities require mega people. And that's what we have today. So in today's session, uh, we need to also recognize what is this global development uh, initiative that seems to have subsumed the Belt and Road Initiative within it? Is this the new form of narrative warfare? Are these narrative Trojans? How should we analyze these? And I think that many of our people here today will dilate upon this. What should we do about the requirement to bring Eastern Africa into the Indo-Pacific fold? How should we reach down and bring up the countries of Oceania 
and as particularly the South Pacific Forum Island nations. So once again, we have experts whom we have drawn upon uh, to answer these questions. And these are the difficult questions that we hope that this particular session, which will be moderated by our very own hugely knowledgeable, experienced, and hands-on secretary to the government of India in the Ministry of Port, Shipping, and Waterways, Mr. T.K. Ramachandran, will address. Of course, each speaker will have only 15 minutes, and there's no way that he can answer all those questions, and, or she can answer all those questions in just 15 minutes. But what I do hope and what I do expect from this session is your participation. Pepper them, bombard them with tough questions. Don't ask immediately the question that you mugged up when you were in high school. Ask the one which is relevant to this question. Ask them, make them uncomfortable, make them answer. With that, let me hand over to the ever gracious uh, Ms. Divya Rai to continue with the proceedings, and thank you very much for your attention.